the PGA Tour is at Riviera this week. I know you've been there a couple of times. I thought we could start with just a little bit of discussion of what makes this design special. It's, I think it's the best time of the year for people who watch the PGA Tour to think about architecture, probably. So, you know, when you've been to Riviera, what has impressed you particularly about the architecture? Well, I think what's so unique about it or special about it is that the the setting is quite unique and that you've got the clubhouse high up on the hill, but the vast majority of the golf course is kind of down in, in the flatlands. And some of the things that um, Thomas did are somewhat unique. If you think about like the two par threes on the back nine, 14 and 16, they occupy what you might consider the least interesting ground on the property. Whereas more often than not, par threes uh, often occupy maybe the most dramatic or are used to bridge elevation changes or things like that. And so there's some unique aspects to it. Obviously there's the kind of barrancas that weave through the property. Um, so it's just very unique there. I can't think of another golf course that really feels like it in any way. Obviously we talk a lot about the Kikuya and stuff like that, but, uh, it's just a brilliant design from start to finish. There's, there's wonderful aspects to the routing, the, the bunkering and the angles that are in play. Some of the green complexes, it's, it's just a wonderful spot from start to finish and, and unique. And, and that's one of the things that that's special about it as well. Yeah. And you, you know, you think about the two par threes on the front nine, you mentioned the two par threes <laughs> on the back nine and how they're kind of in that, the least interesting part of the property is, is the middle, but the whole property yeah. is kind of difficult because when you're not in the middle, you're on these sides of a Canyon and you can't play golf on the sides of a Canyon that severe, but those par threes on the front nine, four and six are kind of built in to the sides of the Canyon. And Thomas and Bell just did an awful lot of construction there but but you don't really notice it when you're walking the course i mean they built so much there but it's so well concealed it really does again because because the surrounding land is so high and then the valley floor is there the edges is where the excitement is right so that stretch of four through six uh is really dramatic and and to your point how they uh crafted the golf holes into those edges uh, uh, was really brilliant. And, and some of the most exciting parts of the golf course are, are the edges. Is there a hole out there that you think goes underappreciated? Everybody talks about 10. Maybe there's another hole or two that people obsess about at Riviera. Is there one that you think is kind of underrated? Well, I, again, I, I have limited time there, just been there a couple of times, but I think my initial takeaway was I just fell in love with the fifth hole, uh, which is, a medium to longer par four, uh, again, kind of in the Western, I guess the Northwest corner of the property on one of those edges. So you've got the big hillside to the right, and then there's, um, kind of, a a bisecting ridge line within the hole. And, and so just very interesting landforms. And then, you know, maybe some of the others are, are the holes on the, the Southern end of the property where the wash is in play. Um, so that'd be what seven, eight and 13, I think, uh, all, right. all relate to the wash. So, yeah. And to an extent, uh, 12 and, uh, 12 and 13, uh, <laughs> though, uh, maybe not as much 12, but those are all kind of at that, at that, it's like the low end of the property. So that's where the water would naturally kind of, uh, course through the property on its, on its route down to the ocean. Yeah, there's the big kind of barranca or wash that weaves through. And, and then, you know, there were, I think, two examples of split fairways that he had where you could go to either side of the wash. And, you know, what they are today probably isn't what they were originally. I'm sure there's a lot of us that would love to see some form of kind of restoration uh, of some of those aspects uh, and, and what it could be. Uh, but just, uh, again, at 30,000 feet, it's really interesting stuff. And, 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 great golf throughout you're you're preaching to the choir when it comes to <laughs> a restoration of riviera particularly the the barranca though you know one interesting thing about the history of riviera is that and i learned this from from jeff shackelford 
the the barranca as it now appears though it's it's mostly covered in turf so you, you can't really see that it's a barranca but it used to be a lot shallower it used to be you've used the term wash it used to look right. quite a bit more like that kind of like what they have at rustic canyon but right. um there were the floods in 1938 and that changed a lot of things about the geography of LA, including, I believe, creating the LA river, but it obviously deepened that water course quite a bit. And and so it is different from what it was in, in the mid to late twenties. Uh, but there could be, you know, I just think about, can you naturalize that Barranca? Can you do something like what they did at Los Angeles country club and really kind of rough <laughs> that up in there? Well, there's so many wonderful examples just down the street, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. pretty night and day to go to LACC and then go to Riviera and see kind of the difference in presentation. Um, and I think I, I would put Riviera and Pasatiempo, I'd lump those two together as golf courses to me that are probably greater than the sum of their parts. The, and the reason I say that is when you go to Riviera, you go to Pasatiempo, there's all sorts of things that you could find that are objectionable. They both have full length concrete cart paths that are kind of in the way and ugly, right? Riviera has got, right? There are houses around. Riviera has got, Riviera's got this driving range in the middle with these giant nets and poles. It's littered with eucalyptus trees everywhere that, you know, they've done a better job maintaining them there than most, but, you know, aren't necessarily what you want to be interacting with. The Kikuya really does limit the playability in particular around the greens. Pasatiempo has got the, the houses, road crossings, all this stuff, trees, probably. Trees in weird it, places. Yeah. Trees in weird but, places. But understandable places like to, to keep people from being killed and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And yet, at the end of the day, both of them, in my opinion, are, are you know some of the greatest golf courses in the world. And and so, you know, there's there's other examples of golf courses where maybe the sum is less than, uh, you know, or the the whole is less than the sum of the parts. But those two in particular, you've got all these little things that you could nitpick about, and yet they're just unbelievably great golf courses that you'd love to play day in and day out, and would never tire of, and have stood the test of time. They might be the two best designed golf courses in America. Now I haven't played every course in America, but they're up there in terms of like just pure, this course was masterfully, you know, almost perfectly designed for this piece of property, Pasatiempo and Riviera. I'm a, I'm a homer. I, I grew up in California. So, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but I think those two courses are are really up there just in terms of what the architect accomplished with a particular piece of land in both cases, kind of a difficult piece of land, but difficult in, in different ways. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about like, if an architect were given a site like Riviera today, you know, just that kind of weird box Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. Flat in the middle, but, but there's slope from, from one end of the property to the uh, property to the other, but there's not a whole lot of like, you know, what we really like to see out of golf contour. There's not like, a huge amount of natural undulation on right. that property before Thomas and Bell got there. There's that interesting little water course, uh, dry water course. Um, and so you have some stuff to work with, but, but really it's, it's kind of a weird, awkward, uh, in some ways less than optimal property. How do you think a modern architect would approach that today? If given the same kind of site, do you think like the result would be really different from, from what George Thomas and Billy Bell did? It's a really great question. Um, I might, I might uh, agree to disagree on how good the site is. I think it's all a matter of perspective, right? I mean, to me, the site at Riviera is pretty damn good in terms of it's a, it's a core golf course. You know, you don't have roads and houses bisecting it. You do have the interesting wash that works its way through the property. There is elevation change to it. Obviously, it's in a wonderful kind of climate. So you can play golf 365 days a year and things like that. So I think there's lots to like about it. To your point, um, I think the biggest question would be on routing, right? And so, you know, when did the decision to put the clubhouse high on the hill come about? Would everybody today choose to put the clubhouse way high on the hill? Thomas um, brought 
brought the ninth hole back. I mean, it doesn't get all the way up to the clubhouse, but it does get back to the clubhouse, which he did at, at LACC and Bel Air and other places. So that would be one question is, would a modern architect have returning nines or would you lay it out in such a way that the, the ninth hole might have been at the far end of the property? It's not a huge site in terms of, you know, um, it's not like Aaron Hills where you had 650 acres to, to find golf holes wherever you wanted. They were going to end up running parallel to each other. So f- simply fitting the golf holes onto the property is an exercise in itself. And then at least for me, you know, I would be kind of probably starting with the wash. How do we want to work with the wash um, and, and figuring out some of those aspects to it? Um, so I think it'd be a fascinating routing exercise. Uh, obviously, much of what we love about Riviera today is what he did after the routing was established and setting up bunker patterns and working with landforms and creating great green complexes and things like that. But to me, I'd love to – it'd be a great uh, – armchair architect uh, routing exercise uh, competition uh, to, to see how, how would people deal with that site today? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in what spots on the property would they rely on built features? Because, it, you know, you mentioned those par threes in the middle of the property before that, I mean, those are constructed holes, but they're, they're not like massively reshaped portions of the property. They just kind of sit on the land more or less a lot of the big building at Riviera was on the sides of the Canyon to make the holes playable. I wonder if a modern architect would look at the middle of the property, say that's not interesting enough and really try, (laughs) really try to fancy that, that portion of the property up a little bit. Well, you know what would have happened in the eighties and nineties, there'd be lakes down there. (laughs) Yeah, that's true Uh, for drainage. Yeah. yeah, Forget about the natural drainage uh, (laughs) at that end of the property with the Barranca. Let's build some ponds. When I talked to Jeff Shackelford and asked him about Riviera, um, I was a little bit surprised. My my understanding, based on what, what he said, and I could have this wrong, is uh, and maybe why 14 and 16 are very much lay of the land, is I believe those sycamore trees are original and have been there from the beginning and are kind of the oldest trees on the property. And so mm-hmm. that would kind of lead to tying in with the lay of the land in, in that area. So I'm not sure what kind of environmental regulations they had back in the twenties, if the, they were required to keep the sycamores or not, but I, they I, did. I, I very much doubt it, but maybe it was just <laughs> difficult to remove them or they didn't want to. That's a good yeah. point about 16. It is one of the things you don't see when it's on TV is that that hole is kind of surrounded or in this little like micro environment created by those sycamore trees and it's really beautiful and you look at it and you're like yeah these are better than those eucalyptus trees that are all (laughs) over the course by the way which are you know they're all over uh, california as you know but not not native to california those are from australia um where i believe they call them widow makers because they shed branches and things and and can be a safety hazard for people stuff falls on people i think we're at a a, you know a, a reckoning in, in California as it relates to eucalyptus in terms of, you know, they are dangerous. They are now old enough where they are at the end of their useful life and they are falling all over the place. Uh, you know, we had one fall up, uh, not on the golf course, but up in Golden Gate Park a couple of weeks ago and fell on a car. And, and so, I mean, it's a serious issue. And to your point, they are, they are literally all throughout California. Um, and, and we would be well served to remove many of them. <laughs> 